Well, good morning. How's everyone doing today? Well, welcome to Vineyard Community Church. I'm Pastor Jacob, and along with uh, my wife, Erin, we're, we're the student ministry pastors here at Vineyard. We get to work every week with our high school and middle school students, also with our 18 to 25 college-age students, so we get the honor of doing that. But this weekend, I get to hang out with you guys, and so I'm very excited about that. Um, we are in a series right now called Healthy for the Holidays. And, you know, normally health is the last thing we're thinking about during the holidays. You know, we're not thinking about being healthy. We're thinking about turkey legs. We're thinking about stuffing, mac and cheese. Does anyone, want, does anyone in here love, love cranberry sauce? I love cranberry sauce. You know, then when December comes, we're thinking about how many Christmas cookies we can eat until Christmas. You know, that's normally what we're thinking about. Last week, Pastor Andy talked about food fitness, and if you missed it, I recommend you to, to go to our website, vineyardchurch.com, and listen to it. It was awesome. This week, if you're taking notes or following along on your outline, we are speaking from the subject of financial fitness, financial fitness. Now, check out this story in the Bible. You can find it on your outlines. It's in Mark chapter 10. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a young rich man ran up to him. Ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have. And give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, what a crazy story. What a story is this? Here's this young rich man, the most eligible bachelor. I think they even had a TV show for him at that time called The Bachelor. It, uh, and he, he, he runs up to Jesus, and he says, I want eternal life. And, and Jesus gives him a challenge, and in response, he walks away because, because of his wealth. Now, see, when it comes to money, especially around the holidays, it's hard. It can, get, it can be very difficult. Um, the average American household adds over $1,000 in debt during the holiday season. Now, why does this happen during the holiday times? Why do we feel the need to buy things we can't afford? Why do we add um, debt to, to, our, to our lives and stress us out even more? It's kind of like what Charlie Brown says in the Christmas special. He says, I know it's the happiest time of the year, Linus, but why am I so depressed? <laughs> See, I believe financial issues that we face actually have little to do with money, has little to do with items, but it has everything to do with trust. It has to do with trust in God. See, your solution to your money problems are actually found right on your dollar bill, which actually leads me to my tweetable thought. In God we trust. It's in God that we trust. Not in money, not in finances, but it's God. And I actually encourage you, you can, you can post that on Twitter or, or Facebook or Instagram. It's pretty cool when you do that. And, and make sure you at Vineyard VA. Um, see, money is a trust thing. And like the title says, it's called financial fitness. It's not called how to get rich in two days. It's not called give all your money to the church. It's not called get rich or die trying. This is called financial fitness because I believe money takes some time. Now, before I talk about money, I have to share my story about physical fitness, okay? 
Now, for the past six years, I've been on this um, journey, you could say, called hashtag HSB, which stands for Hot Summer Body. <laughs> and I have not reached my mission yet. I have not, I have not got it. Um, so, see, every time I go to the gym, I work out, I feel good. I actually like the gym. I like working out. But the only pro I got one problem with the gym. I got one problem with working out. See, when I work out, the next day, I expect to see the results. <laughs> but I don't see it. And, and the next day, I wake up, and in my head, when I wake up, I should kind of look like this a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everybody would go to the gym if the next day, that's what you look like when, when, when you woke up. But every day when I wake up after the gym, this is actually what I look like. <laughs> it's like, man, it didn't work out again. I was like, I tried. I even did extra arms, and it still looked like this. See, I remember one time when I was 19, I went to a CrossFit gym. I don't know if you heard about those, those guys and girls. They're pretty crazy. But um, I came in with a headband. I had this bright red shirt. I went into the gym. I was ready to start my pathway to hashtag HSB. And, and I was ready for it. And, and when I walked in, I looked around, and everybody, every single person, guy and girl, was just ripped, jacked. I said, did I walk into the gym or did I walk into the set of 300? <laughs> I don't know where I am right now. But every single person was just ripped. And so but anyways, I was still feeling confident. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. It's going to be good. And, and, um, and I go into this group workout that we're doing, and we're doing this thing called clean and jerks. So what it, what it is is you stand in front of your barbell, and you, and you go, you bend down, and you have to do a clean, which is when you lift up the weight, you do a clean, and then you have to pop it over your head. And so I'm like, this is no problem. I got this. I could do this for sure. And so we start, everyone's doing it, they're killing it, and I'm like, okay, let me get ready for this. I stand in front of my weight, you know, I put the white powder stuff on my hand. I don't even know what that means, that's that looks cool, so you just like throw the powder in the air, it's like, oh, look. <laughs> It's so, uh, it's so uh, you know, I'm getting in front of my weight. I'm ready to do I stretch a little bit. You know, I check out my bar and make sure it's good. And, and I go in to lift it up, and it's like, Ugh. that's just a practice. Let me, let me stretch over time. That's a practice. Let me do it one more time. Do it again. Ugh. Didn't get up. So, and then all of a sudden, I hear this voice that says, hey, you with the red shirt. I look around and say, God, is that you? <laughs> You're telling me not to do this? You're telling me to go to McDonald's? Uh, and it wasn't God. It, it, was, uh, it was the trainer who, uh, who was, he was on top of this box, instructed everybody. And uh, he said, hey, you with the red shirt, switch out your weights to the girl next to you. <laughs> you want me to switch my weights with her? And then all of a sudden, she just grabs my weight. She grabs it with one hand, too. Just grabs my weight, moves over, gives me her, her weight, and then she starts doing her workout. I just looked at her, and I said, and I warmed it up for you. <laughs> I got it. I don't even know what that meant. I just felt like it was the right thing to say. And then I, I went to do the new weight, which was lighter. And, um, you know, I go to pick it up. I was like, this time I got it. And then I, I go, and I was I was like, man, is there a magnet on the ground? <laughs> There must be a magnet here because I can't lift it up. And if they actually, she stopped her workout and helped me do it. And then, like, after five reps, I was like, I got to go running. I can't do this. I'm going to go for a jog. You know, it was pretty embarrassing. But, but, uh, but now I actually enjoy working out. And me and my wife, Erin, we, we go to the gym about five or six times a week. And Erin and is actually stronger than me now. And I'm okay with that. That's, that's okay with me. We actually traded places. I, I cook and clean. And... Um, <laughs> And now if we hear a strange noise in the middle of the night, she gets up and checks it out. You know, and that's fine with me. I'm like, get them, babe, get them. Get the... <laughs> See, but finances are, like, like, are a lot like working out. It's not like one day you're just going to wake up and be out of debt. You're not just going to one day wake up and have good spending habits. You're not just going to one day get up and all your money is going to be in order. It takes dedication and being intentional about getting your finances in a place that you aren't stressing out about money anymore. You can't just wake up and expect it for it to be, to be done. You got to get financially fit. See, but may I suggest again, though, 
that money isn't just about items. It's not just about stuff, but money is actually a heart condition. It's a condition of the heart. Point one you can find on your outlines is this. Financial fitness starts with being aware of your condition. Starts with being aware of your condition. You'll never go to the gym if you don't think you're out of shape. You have to be real with yourself. When it comes to money, you have to be aware of your condition. Now check out another story in the Bible, in 2 Kings. It says this, it says, The wife of a man from the com company of prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he loved the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. See, here is a widow, and women in that day normally didn't have the ability to support themselves. And so since her husband is dead, the next in line to support her would be her two sons. But they're, they're too young to provide for her. And now this creditor is coming to take them because the only thing that she has that is worth the amount of money that she's in debt to is to sell her boys. See, but the problem is this. When they would turn to age to be able to support her, they would be gone. This, Rome, this woman is now on the road to homelessness. The, this woman has become aware that her financial situation is about to ruin her personal life. It is about to cause major problems. This woman is in distress and worried. See, I understand that her money issues have just turned into trust issues. She can be asking herself, she said, she could be asking God and say, God, my husband followed you. My husband believed in you. He did anything for you. He serves you faithfully until his dying day. But why now is this happening to his family? Now, I can completely understand how she could have some trust issues there. And this is what happens. See, but this is what we have to do. We have to become aware of our financial issues. We have to become aware. You have to ask yourself. I have to become aware that I can't keep living paycheck to paycheck because I can't enjoy my life because I keep thinking about the past due amounts that I see on my bills. I have to become aware that I overspend because I'm trying to act like somebody I'm not. See, we have to become aware of our condition. And no condition is better or worse. You may be in here today and you may be the overspender. You may be the person in tons of debt. You may be the person who can't keep a job Maybe the, you may be the person who thinks their money makes them important. Or you may even be the person that has an addiction that has taken a lot of your finances. It doesn't matter, but what does is we have to become aware so we can start moving forward, so we can start seeing God move. Like this woman, she became aware that her financial problems actually represented personal problems. Point two on your outline is this. Financial fitness is right in front of you. Financial fitness is right in front of you. See, check out Elisha, the prophet's reply to this widow. He says, Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me what you have in your house. Now, this isn't the answer she wants to hear. She's like, uh, I just told you I have nothing in my house. I'm sure she was hoping when she came up to Elisha, knowing that her husband used to, used to um, um, serve with them, that, that Elisha would just say, oh, you're in debt, you're, you have some problems, here's a check, and I'll give it to you. But this is not what Elisha says. Elisha, sa Elisha says, what do you have? And she's like, I have nothing. That's why I came to you. But Elisha says, what do you have? Check out her response. She says, your servant has nothing there at all except a small jar of olive oil. Except a small jar of olive oil. Your, your servant has nothing. Wait, I do have this one jar. I, I do have this one thing. See, in biblical times, olive oil was one of the greatest wealths that you could have. And this is what happens. Elisha asks her this question because, because this is what can happen in our lives. Circumstances get hard. Situations become dark. Problems come at our face. And when this happens, we can forget about what God has already spoken over our lives. See, when, when situations get hard, we, start, we tend to focus on our situation and not the God that can solve our problem. See, we can't doubt in the dark what God has promised us while we were in the light. See, dark situations don't cancel out 
what God has already spoken. So Elisha spoke in a way to make, her, to make her think about what God has already done in her life. Because God is good at using what's right in your hand right now to take you where he wants you to go. See, check this out. Joshua 21, 45 says, not one of, not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. Not one promise God spoke of your life will fail. God hasn't failed, and he's not going to start with you. He's going to keep moving because his promises are good. He's a good father, and he loves you. See, point one today is financial fitness starts with being aware of your conditions. Point two is financial fitness is right in front of you. Point three, financial fitness is found in trust in God. Financial fitness is found in trust in God. So the story continues. Elisha said, go around and ask your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go, then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put one to the, put one to the side. Now this is crazy. This makes no sense. And, I can, be, and I, can be, I can imagine this woman thinking to herself, she's like, I just told you I only have one small jar of olive oil. Why do you want me to get other jars and just pour one jar of, of oil into the next jar of oil? That makes no sense. That sounds crazy. <laughs> See, I can tell you this, and maybe I'm the only one, but sometimes trusting God, it can sound kind of crazy. It can feel kind of not like the easiest thing. See, this is a faith walk. It's not a logic walk. The Bible says we're to walk by faith, not by sight. Because sometimes God wants to challenge our faith. Sometimes God wants us to, to, to trust in him. It's not, always, it's not always a logic walk. It's something that requires faith. You want to know what else is kind of crazy? That can seem kind of crazy? No, it's gonna be, can I just be real today? Can I just be honest? Tithing 10% of what you make can kind of feel crazy sometimes, right? See, I'm just going to be honest. I'm just going to be real with you today. You're telling me that I should give 10% of what I make before taxes? Yeah, I am. And God will bless me? Yes, he will. But, but I'm not saying if you give $10, God's going to come around and give you $100. I'm not saying that at all. I'm telling you this. There is a freedom that comes when you become a consistent tither. There's a freedom that comes when you give to the church. For me, growing up, I never had a lot. And when I started making money, tithing was very hard for me. But it had nothing to do with money because if I didn't give to the church, I know I'd just buy too much food at Chick-fil-A. You know, it's not like, it's not like I was going to do something productive with it. Who in here has ever been to Target and you left Target and, and you say to yourself, why did I buy these things? <laughs> this is something about it. See, it has nothing to do with money. But when I started to tithe consistently, I started to actually open up my heart to trust in God in every area of my life. See, that was just a starting place. When I started trusting him with my finances, I started to trust him with my relationships. I started to trust him with my career path. I started to trust him with every area. It just opened up my heart to trust God because I began to believe that Jesus was actually my provider, that Jesus was actually, one, actually the one who was for me. But I understand there's things that prevent, from, prevent you from tithing because I went through the same process. I know one thing that can prevent you from tithing is worry. If you worry about if your bills are going to get paid or not, and, and if what else could I could do with that money? You may be asking yourself, you may think it's a waste of money because you don't, you don't understand wh why we do it. You may think it's a waste of money. Another thing is you may not understand what it goes to. And let me just pause real fast right here. When you give to Vineyard Community Church, it goes to reach in our, our, our city. It goes to reach in our community. And here's a great example of it. This past Thursday and Friday, we had a youth event called Invite Night where we saw hundreds of students come out. And between the, our Thursday and Friday, we had 74 um, decision, first-time decisions for Jesus Christ this past week. And that happens, that happens because of your giving, because of what you sow into the church, because of what you give. And, and you get to play a part of that. You get to play a part in advancing God's kingdom to the Hampton Roads area and beyond. That's what it goes to. 
Some other things that may prevent tithing is fear that God won't provide. I may be in here and spending money just makes you feel good. And that's, then that prevents you from giving. But I can tell you this, and this is the truth. God is not in heaven sitting in front of his MacBook Pro because God loves Apple products, just to let you know. <laughs> He's not sitting in front of his, his, his MacBook looking at his checking account thinking to himself, he's not saying, oh, no, Miss Jenkins didn't give this week. Well, this, ain't gonna, this isn't good. Miss Jenkins didn't give. Tell the angels to only take five-minute showers because we got to make some budget cuts in heaven. No, that's not what he's saying. He's God. He's the maker of heaven and earth. He created the seas and everything in it. God doesn't need your money. Tithing is an opportunity for you to activate faith in your life. It's an opportunity for you to activate trust in your life, to put God first in your life. It's, it has nothing to do, and if God's going to be able to pay his bills, he's God. He's going to be okay. But it activates your level of faith. And here is what we see Elisha does to this widow. Elisha easily could have said, well, here's some money, pay the creditor. He easily could have said, well, I'll take care of the situation. But Elisha says, what do you have in your hand? What do you have at your house? Because what you have in your hand, God can use to elevate your faith. God can use you to, to, so you can see his faith and his love come to play in your life. And this is what happens. She goes to the neighbor. She's asking for jars. That's weird already. <laughs> then she gets the jar. She comes back to her house. She shuts the door. And I can just imagine the first, the first jar that she has. She, she has it right here. And she has her jar of olive oil. And she's like, Elisha is crazy. What, what is he asking me to do? He wants me to pour olive oil into a new jar. This, is, this man must be out of his mind. And then all of a sudden... She pours it in there, and imagine as she's pouring this jar, she looks at her jar, she's like, is my jar the same? I got two jars. Hey, give me the big one real fast. Let me get the big jar real fast. Let's try this one more time. Then she pours the olive oil, and then she looks at it. This one's full, and she looks at her jar, and it's full. And then she does another one, and another one, and another one. And with each jar, her faith starts to grow a little bit more. Her trust in God starts to increase a little bit more. And it actually reminds me of a story about Jesus in the Gospels. It reminds me of a story where Jesus is sitting at the water well. He's sitting at the fountain. And it's around the noon hour. He's tired. His disciples are out getting food. And he's sitting there. Then the Bible says that a woman walks up to the well. And, that we, and we discover that this woman has been divorced five times. And then even the man that she's with right now isn't even her husband. We see that she's isolated and, and that she has some problems. We even discover that it's the noon time where she meets Jesus. And most of the women will go in the morning time together to get water for their family. But she's going by herself for, in the afternoon because she's isolated by her community. The people don't like her. She has a lot of problems and a lot of issues. But then she meets Jesus. And Jesus says to her, I'll give you water that will make you never thirst again. And she's like, oh, I want this water. I think I heard about that. It's called Gatorade, right? Let me get some of that. And Jesus is like, no, it's not Gatorade. Jesus doesn't say that in the Bible. I made that up. <laughs> Jesus looks at her and says, no. No, it's not physical water. I want to give you living water. I want to give you more of me. I want to be the one that refreshes your spirit. I want to be the one that, that motivates you to live. You kept trying to find your purpose in these bad relationships. And you kept trying to find your purpose in all these things because you didn't trust me. But he's saying, when you trust me, I won't disappoint you. I'll keep providing for you. I'll supply for you. I'll meet your every need. And this is what we see with the widow. God comes through and meets her needs. So check this out. Jesus also says this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable than a bird? If God takes care of the birds in the air, don't you think he's going to take care of you? 
Don't you think he'll supply for you and meet your needs? You don't see the birds flying around worried about when the next check is going to come through because they know their God provides for them. And I'm going to tell you this today. You're far more valuable than a bird in the sky. God made you. God has a plan for your life. And he's not going to let anything harm you. See, and I know this because the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave Jesus to us. So he gave because he wants to meet our needs. He's our supplier. Jesus continues. He says, don't worry about these things. Saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of all unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows your needs. I just want you to know something. God already knows the situation you're going through. God already knows the problems in your life. He's very aware of the issues, and he wants you to know today that he's going to meet your needs. He's going to meet you right where you're at. Just activate your faith in him today. Just activate your trust in him today, and he's going to meet you right where you are. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Jesus is our supplier. Jesus is the one that provides for us. And the widow is pouring these jars and God meets her needs because she lived obediently to God. The story finishes like this. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left and the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God and he said, go sell all, go sell all the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. And God did even more than she ever could dream of or imagine. Point one today is this. Financial fitness starts with being aware of your condition. Point two is financial fitness is right in front of you. Point three, financial fitness is found in trusting God. And my fourth and final point today is financial fitness is believing God is worth more than our possessions. It's believing that God is worth more than our possessions. Here's the story about a widow who trusts God and saw God move beyond her expectations. In the beginning of my message, I told a story about a young rich man who wanted eternal life. But after Jesus challenged him to sell everything, he went away sad because of his great wealth. He comes up to Jesus with these good intentions. And, and the Bible says Jesus looked at him and said, just one thing you lack. One thing you lack, to sell everything and follow me. Now, is this Jesus saying that he doesn't like stuff and he doesn't like things? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. The one thing that he lacked was not wealth. The one thing that he lacked was that his identity was wrapped up in what he could gain and it wasn't wrapped up in Jesus. He's saying, just sell it all and follow me. Jesus looked at him with love, looked past his wealth and looked into his heart and said, the one thing you lack is that, is that you actually don't believe that I can provide the best life for you. He's saying, you lack trust. He's saying, just trust me. And the rich man is like, but I worked so hard and I gained these things and I, and I worked my way up to the top and, and I did this and I got this and I, and I, and I own this and, and you're telling me you want me to give up everything and follow you? And Jesus is saying, yeah, because, because everything you own fails in comparison to the grace love of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of your sins and the motivation that he gives to make you live beyond your expectations, beyond your limitations, and brings you to a new level of life. See, living for Jesus provides the best life possible. The best life possible. It's in God we trust. It's in God we see fulfillment for our lives. It's in God we see our purpose come to life. Jesus challenges him not to forsake his wealth, but Jesus challenges his heart condition. He challenges the condition of his heart. Jesus says you may gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul. See, when your life is done, 
The world will not be changed by what you gain. The world will be changed by what you gave. And we know this through Jesus, that he gave his whole life for us. He gave it all. He gave everything for us. And I have a closing story. There's this missionary team that went to an unreached people group area, to a place that never heard about Jesus before, didn't know who Jesus was. They, uh, they set up their tents and they went into the villages nearby and started to invite people to their service. Now this was all, like I said, it was an unreached people group. They did, this is people hearing about Jesus for the first time. The people came out to the service and the preacher started to speak about Jesus to, to the people. The preacher said that Jesus left his home and started his ministry to help people. There was a man in the village who came and, and he heard this and he, he walks up to the front of the stage and then he lays down an item from his house. He looks up at the preacher and with his broken English, he said, Jesus left his house. I'll give him a piece of my house. The preacher man didn't really understand what the man in the village was doing, but he kept on going. The preacher continued, and he spoke, about, he spoke about how Jesus performed miracles, how Jesus fed people, and how Jesus even fed over 5,000 men. The man in the village, again, comes up front, and he lays down a piece of food on the stage. He looks up at the preacher, and he says, Jesus fed people, I'll feed people. The preacher man continues to preach, and he says that Jesus healed people. The man left the tent, went into his home. He grabbed an item that the people in the village used to, to heal wounds. He came back into the tent, walked up to the stage, and he laid it down on the stage. He said, Jesus heals. I want to heal people. Finally, the preacher man talks about how Jesus went to the cross, though he never sinned. So he never made a mistake and that Jesus died for every single person. The man in the village moved by this message with tears in his eyes comes rushing down the stage, what, rushing down the aisle and he lays his body on the stage. The preacher looks at him and he looks up at the preacher man and with this broken English he says, Jesus lays down his life, I'll lay down my life for this Jesus. See, when we think about what Jesus has done, the best that we can offer is everything. God, I'm going to give you my trust. I'm going to give you my faith. I'll give you my possessions. I'll give you my job. I'll give you my family. I'll give you my problems. I'll give you my gifts. I'll give you my talents. I'll give you everything because what you gave me is worth all that I have. See, we have to lay it down, and we got to see God move in our lives. Romans 8, 32 says this, God, who did not spare his own son, but gave, but gave, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Jesus is the one that will supply for us. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. God, we come to you and we say, help us with our unbelief. Help us with our financial issues. Even as I'm speaking, I could even feel people in this room, you have some financial problems that do come directly close to your personal life, to the way you live. And it's overwhelming to you. You don't see how you're going to get out of it. And I feel like the Lord is saying, your first step is just to look to him to trust him. Even as I was speaking, 
There's some other issues, some other problems. There's some things, and you know what those things are, that are preventing you from trusting God in certain areas of your life. And I can just overwhelmingly feel like God is saying, I love you. I feel like God is saying, you are more valuable. You're more valuable than anything. And since he values you, he wants to take care of you. You may be in here this morning, and you're saying to yourself, this sounds good. I like what you're saying, but I don't know this Jesus personally. I never made a decision to trust Jesus with my life. I never asked Jesus to come into my heart. Maybe you have done that before, and life kind of got in the way. And you're saying, man, I want to recommit my life back to Jesus and trust him again. If that's you, right where you are in your chair, I'm not going to call you out or anything like that. Just right where you are in your chair, if you want to make a decision to ask Jesus to be the savior of your life, to be the captain of your life, just right where you're at in your chair, just pray this prayer with me in your heart. Just say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I trust you. I make you the captain of my life. Forgive me for my mistakes. Today, I follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.